announcement. So, okay, so what's the plan for today? So as I announced uh, on, on the first day, uh, my plan for today is to do uh, the proof of the data processing inequality for the quantum relative entropy. So remember this was um, like uh, the fundamental property of distance measures in general. So it's relatively simple to prove for um, uh, the trace distance, for example. For the quantum relative entropy, it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, this is what we'll see today. And this is really, I would say, it's a, it's a, it's a central result in, uh, in quantum information theory. It's used uh, everywhere. And it's, I think, almost every proof of uh, uh, converse theorem, like no-go kind of result, uses a form of data processing. Right, so remember yesterday when we proved the uh, Stein's lemma, right? So we had two parts, right? We had uh, the, the part which shows an achievability, which gives a strategy, which achieves a given type two error. Okay, and then we had to show that you cannot do better than this. And if you remember, uh, the place where we use the data processing inequality is when we prove that you cannot do better than uh, the quantum relative entropy. Okay, and for that we used uh, the data processing, and this is basically in in almost all information processing tasks that you try to analyze and to try to, to compute the optimal rates for, you will use the data processing inequality or uh, a form of data processing inequality. Uh, okay, so yeah, okay, so, so, so let's get to it. So, uh, yeah, so again, the, the main uh, objective today is to show this inequality. So I take two states, rho and sigma, or two even positive operators in general, and I apply a quantum channel, the same quantum channel to both sides, and this says that the quantum relative entropy can only decrease. Okay, and so, so the plan for this is as follows, um, is that first we'll show a convexity result. Okay, so uh, uh, this is so. This is a function that takes as input two positive operators and outputs a number. Okay, and uh, uh, it has a nice property of being convex. Okay, we often say also jointly convex because it has two inputs. Okay, so it's it's jointly convex in in the two uh, inputs. Uh, I'll say in a minute explicitly what this means, but it's the it's the natural thing you would expect. Okay, so and then uh, we'll see that convexity is very related to the data processing inequality. Okay, so and we'll see how we can get from convexity to the data processing inequality, to the fact that when I apply quantum channel, it can only decrease. And I should say that this is a very general statement. And uh, so in general, for a general distance measure, uh, when you have convexity, uh, you can get data processing and the other way as well. Okay, I wouldn't say that this is a... Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's under some conditions. It, it, it depends on some particular properties of the, of the divergence we consider, but in general, it's, uh, it's almost always the case that these two uh, uh, statements are equivalent, okay? that you can go from one to the other, and I'll present a proof that is relatively generic that allows you to go from convexity to data processing. The other side you can also, you can also do, um, again, under some conditions. Okay, so uh, once we do that, so this is the, the second point. The, the third point will be that to explore uh, implications of it, and um, uh, namely, this will be, uh, namely, we'll, we'll discuss strong subadditivity. Okay, so this is maybe one of the main implications. So it's a, it's a fundamental inequality on the von Neumann entropy. Okay, okay so good. So uh, now let me, okay, so we'll do, let's start with the, with the first point. And so let me state it uh, as a theorem. Okay, so I consider this function, so as I said, so that maps rho and sigma, so recall the expression for the quantum relative entropy is trace rho log rho minus rho log sigma. Um, and uh, I, my claim is that this is convex. The, what the theorem says is that this is a convex function. Okay, so uh, notice that, yeah, so it takes two inputs so what do I mean by convex here is that if I take a convex combination of rho 0 and rho 1 in the first, um, uh, in the first uh, input of the re relative entropy and the same convex combination in the second input, then this is upper bounded by 
the convex combination of the corresponding quantum relative entropies. Okay. Okay, so how will I show this? So I, w I will uh, even show you this in a way that uh, is makes it very explicitly convex. And what do I mean by this? I mean that I will write uh, an equality. So I will write the quantum relative entropy uh, using a different expression than its, than its definition that makes it very clear that it's convex. Okay, and what do I mean by this? So I mean that I will write it as a supremum of functions that are linear in rho and sigma. OK, so, so let's go a bit over this expression. The exact details of the expression don't matter for now. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that, OK, so it's, it's a supremum okay, over some operators, okay, so over uh, an infinite family of operators, zt, one for every t, okay, from 0 to uh, infinity. And uh, then I take an integral, okay, from zero to infinity of uh, an expression, and this is the important part, an expression which is linear in rho and sigma. Okay. Um, yeah. So the crucial thing that I want to emphasize here, at least at this stage, is that uh, this expression is linear in rho and sigma. Okay. So of course, a function that is linear is in particular convex, right? And um, it's, it's a very simple kind of convex function. And the supremum of uh, linear functions, and even the supremum of convex functions, is convex as well. Okay, So if you accept this, uh, uh, this equality, then convexity becomes obvious. And this is even a certificate, if you want, a certificate of uh, the convexity of this function. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reiterating this point here, is that uh, this expression that I'm giving here in star uh, makes it manifestly convex as a supremum of convex functions. And OK, so I even uh, included a, a brief proof of this. So uh, if you have a set f of linear functions, right, uh, and you take a supremum over all these functions f in this family uh, script f, uh, and uh, of the, this function applied to the convex combination, then just by linearity here, um, you get that this is 1 minus p f of rho 0 sigma 0 plus p uh, f of rho 1 sigma 1. OK, and then of course you can separate the two suprema. OK, so you have a supremum of a sum. This is smaller than the sum of the two suprema. OK, so this is obvious. And this, if you want, you, you can see it. Uh, uh, in the picture, uh, this is something you're probably used to. Maybe it's useful to have this picture. So, right? If you t in in one D, if you take a function that is convex, right? So you can write it as the supremum of these linear functions. Right? Okay, see what I mean. So all these linear functions. Okay, my function is not very nice, but uh, right. If you if you consider, for example, the tangents at every point. Right. So these are linear functions, and this my the function of interest is a supremum of all of these tangents. Okay. So in some sense, the expression I'm giving is an analog of this. Right? OK. Good. OK, so uh, this, yeah, so the other remark I wanted to make is that, yes, for this expression, I mean, I never said what, what the base of the log is. Usually it doesn't matter because we were only comparing relative entropies. Uh, but here for this expression, uh, it matters. So it's, I take uh, the log base E. OK, if you want to get the log base 2, you just uh, divide by log 2. But, um, but yeah, this expression is for this log base E. Uh, OK, so yeah, another thing is that this expression is, uh, is quite nice is in that it allows you also to, uh, to prove data processing 
uh, directly without going through this, uh, this, this the standard proof of going from convexity to data processing. Okay, I mean both proofs are relatively easy, but I'll, I'll present both of them just to so that you see that this expression, so that you see the the potential uses of this uh, of this um, way of writing the, the the quantum relative entropy. Uh, yeah, so this way of writing the quantum relative entropy is not very well known uh, usually, or, or uh, so. Uh, but I think it's useful, and I have been using it recently for computational purposes. So I wanted to. Uh, to present it to you. Okay. Good. So, so yeah. So, given this, so the only thing I have to prove now is this expression, right? So, yes. About, about that expression. Yes. Uh, I have, you said like you don't want to talk too much about uh, how to describe the expression, but can you say something about you know how does one come up with this? Like you don't, I assume you don't get this expression. So like, is this coming from like something? Uh, yes, I will actually prove it. I will prove it. Yes, yes, yeah. So uh, what I was saying is that the the whole proof actually of strong summativity will be to prove this expression. Okay. Um, yes. Ah, yeah. There's a T missing. Yes, you're right. Thanks. Let me fix that right now. Thanks. Other questions? Good. Uh, okay. So uh, yes. So again, this is my objective. I want to, to to write this expression. And so yeah, the first thing to note, maybe I mean, I guess you all know this, but uh, but just uh, to see the, the the difficulty here. The main difficulty here is that we have logs of operators that are not commuting. Right. So rho and sigma are in general don't commute. Okay. So I don't have that the log of rho minus log of sigma is log of rho sigma inverse or something of this form. Okay, so this even doesn't make sense because uh, uh, rho sigma inverse is not, po is not a positive operator, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, to make sure that you're all aware that this is the main difficulty. Okay, so, uh, so, okay, so what, what, uh, what are we going to do um, in order to, to get this expression? So, um, <coughs> we would like to have just a single log, right? So, so having a difference of log is a bit difficult to handle. And so we would like to have uh, an expression which involves just a single log. And so one way of, uh, uh, of doing this is by using this uh, uh, simple trick, right? Where you write, uh, you write the trace of a product of two operators. Right in terms of right, it's bilinear in A and B, so you write it in terms of the tensor product of A and B. Okay, this is a simple trick. I'm sure you've seen variants of it. Um, yeah, it's it's very simple. You just uh, check that this works. So you write A tensor B, and here I uh, I chose the version where you sandwich it with uh, um, a, a fixed maximally entangled state or a an, non-normalized an version. Okay, so sum over I of I I, where I is some fixed basis of my Hilbert space. And here the transpose is in the same basis. Okay. Okay. So now using this, I will write the recall the expression for the quantum relative entropy is is a trace of products. So I will just use this expression. Okay. And so I write it as uh, uh, I will, my operator a will be just rho log rho. And um, uh, Okay, the tensor identity for the first part, right? And for the second part, I'll take A to be uh, rho and uh, B transpose to be uh, the log of sigma transpose, which is uh, log of sigma transpose. Okay. Okay, so now uh, notice that, yeah, okay, so I'll, 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 I did it slowly. So, so uh, yeah, I just. Uh, rewrite it so as rho tensor identity times log rho tensor identity plus identity tensor log sigma transpose. And um, uh, here notice that um, uh, because the rho and the sigma are commuting, I can combine them into a single log. Okay, and uh, what I'm using here is this, this expression. So the fact that log of a tensor b is equal to log a 
tensor identity plus identity tensor log b. Okay. And so, uh, yes, so now I have written the quantum relative entropy as this rho tensor identity times log of rho tensor sigma inverse transpose. Okay, okay so now uh, uh, starting from this, okay, we have a single log. Uh, what we'll do is that we'll use this uh, integral representation for the log. Okay, this is often useful in this area, and you've seen this in the first problem session, right? This was uh, quite useful in order to prove, for example, the operator convexity and the operator monotonicity of the log, right? Because you, you, you prove the operator monotonicity of the inverse function, and then you use uh, this integral representation to directly get the operator convexity and monotonicity of the log function or minus log function. Uh, okay, and here, so here we'll do the same, we'll use even the same expression, right? So remember, you used exactly this expression for, uh, in, your, in, in, in the exercise session of the first day. Uh, so let's use this, and so where here, uh, I will apply to, so okay, this is valid for scalars, right? By the, by, but by the functional calculus that, that I have, um, uh, that we've seen, right? For, so for matrices, you can apply function for matrices as well by just applying the, the corresponding function to the eigenvalues. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the A tensor identity, I just leave it on the side, and now I apply the integral representation to this uh, log. Okay, so... Um, uh, uh, yes, so okay, so I, I, I get... Uh, so A, A tensor identity, the integral, of um, 1 over, I don't know why I put the identities here. This should be more. Okay, so this is just a constant here, right? It doesn't depend on x. Okay, so it's a constant function. Uh, I can put identity here if I want. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I say as ident tensor identity because remember we're working on the tensor product Hilbert space, h tensor h. Okay. Okay, so now um, uh, what about the second term? So this one over t plus x. Um, okay, so uh, the way we can see it is that this is, so x, I replace x by uh, a tensor uh, b inverse. Okay, and this is uh, the identity if you want. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I will just rewrite this expression. So I put the A tensor identity inside, okay, and then the A tensor identity here uh, cancels with the, with the A which is here, and so I get an, an A inverse in the first term. Okay, so here it's just I, I put the A tensor identity inside the integral. Okay, so good. So now we're starting to, to be in, in good shape. Uh, why? Because, okay, so this, this part is simple because it's linear in A. So, okay, so notice that I, so A will be uh, rho and B will be sigma transpose. I just wrote it in general because I didn't want to write the transposes all the time. Um, okay, so, so let's look at this expression. So this part is linear in A, so that's, that's good. Uh, this part is not linear in A and B, okay? But this is a very well studied quantity in matrix analysis, right? It's uh, sometimes called the parallel sum, okay? So, and it's sometimes written in this way. So, uh, A uh, parallel sum B is just one over uh, the sum of the inverses of A and B, okay? And so, this is directly related up to a factor of two to the harmonic mean, okay? So, if A and B are scalars, right? So, you might uh, be aware of the harmonic mean of two scalars, okay? So this is uh, up to a factor of two, the, an operator version of this harmonic mean. Okay. And so this is very well studied in matrix analysis. So we know very well properties of, of this, uh, of the, of in general, of uh, these. The, there, is a, there is a big theory of operator means in general. So you know the geometric mean, for example, there is a... Um, uh, there, is a, there is a definition of, uh, there is a generalization of that to operators, which has also very nice properties, and there is a whole theory uh, related to this. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so good. So you might be worried because I'm taking inverses here. How about uh, if some operators are not invertible and things like this? So I don't want to discuss this during this lecture. This is one can handle it, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't. These are technicalities. I don't want to get into it. And basically, all, all the the properties are satisfied even in this in the general case where they're not invertible. Okay, but and you should see basically the inverse as the inverse of the on the support. Um, Okay, so one of the many uh, nice properties we know of this parallel sum or of this operator harmonic mean is a nice variational expression. Okay, so uh, and we'll, we'll use that uh, to, to get our expression at the end. So, so let's uh, go over it. How does it work? So it says the following. So I take two positive operators, A and B. I take the parallel sum, okay? Um, uh, so A uh, parallel sum B, and I apply it to some uh, vector x in my Hilbert space. Okay, so then it turns out that this has a very simple expression, or a very simple variational expression, which is linear in A and B. Okay, and so what is this expression? So, uh, uh, yeah, I get something linear in A and B, and on what uh, I, I sandwich th them with which uh, vectors, with vectors y and z, okay, and the only constraint is that y and z should sum to x. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, so this, this is the this is the expression. So I even uh, included a proof of it uh, for uh, for completeness. Um, I mean, so I say, okay, wh wh what is hard in this is, is coming up with the expression, but once you come up with the expression, it's relatively simple to check that it's the case, right? Um, uh, so it was just a simple manipulation. So, uh, okay, so yeah, let's, let's go over this quickly. So the, the parallel sum, you can write it in this way. So the sum, the, the inverse of the sum of the inverses, and by some standard manipulation, you can rewrite it as this, okay? So B minus... Um, b times a plus b inverse times b. Okay, and so then what I will do is I will just write uh, this expression minus this expression, okay, for an arbitrary y and z that sum to x, and just observe that it's always non-negative. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, this is what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm writing this expression, so was y, and now z, I take it to be x minus y. Okay, and I'm subtracting uh, the parallel sum between A and B sandwiched with X. Okay, so I, uh, I'll just write it down. So where does uh, uh, the sandwiching with X appear? With B. Okay, so with Y, I get one from A and one from B. And then I get the cross terms, which are here. Um, okay, so then the, and the, the parallel sum term, I just replace the parallel sum with this expression. Okay, so um, uh, this. So this is what I get. Okay, so this cancels with this part, and this is what remains. Okay, so now I observe that this is. Uh, I can see it as a two norm of some operator by taking half of this operator, basically. So everything is Hermitian here, right? It's positive even, right? So A and B are positive operators. Um, so I can take square roots. Okay, here too, I can do the same thing. Uh, and here as well, okay, I'm just starting to write it in a way that will make it uh, uh, obvious that it's, uh, that it's a square. Okay, by just uh, multiplying and dividing by a plus b inverse, a plus b to the power half. Okay, and then, okay, by combining these two, you see that it's just a two norm, right? So it's a two norm of a difference of some vectors. Okay, so uh, x to which I apply some uh, operator and y to which I apply some uh, other operator. Okay, so this is obviously positive, right? non-negative. And I also see with this expression that it's obvious how to make it an equality, right? To make it equal to zero. I just have to pick y so that this thing is equal to zero. Okay, and this is just uh, y is equal to a plus b inverse b times x. Okay. 
more additional philosophy you can convey about what that means? Um, uh, no, unfortunately not uh, here. I, I don't have much... Uh, Oh, you mean uh, to prove it? Uh, uh, you could try to prove it in this way, uh, like say that B is identity and then doing the general case, or? Yeah, so sorry, I don't have much insight on it. Okay, so now let's use this, uh, this expression uh, back in our uh, Okay, yeah, so we just get back to, to our expression. Remember, it was this. Uh, so the relative entropy between rho and sigma. Um, <coughs> uh, yes, okay, so I, I just rewrote the expression I had uh, uh, in the previous slide. Okay. Uh, and then I just put in the phi inside the integral. Okay, and so okay, so let's look at each one of these terms. So this is rho tensor identity sandwiched with phi, and this is the uh, parallel sum between some operator uh, on rho and some operator related to sigma, and I sandwich it with phi. Uh, remember, phi is the maximally entangled state. <coughs> uh, okay, so so let's compute each one of these uh, expressions. Okay, so the first one is easy, right? This is just rho tensor identity, sandwich with phi, this is just trace of rho, okay? Up to this uh, scalar factor, one over t plus one. Okay, so, so this is just trace of, uh, of rho, this is nice. Uh, now, what about the other expression, right? So this is a uh, parallel sum uh, sandwiched by a vector. So this is exactly the setting of the proposition that I showed here. Um, and so I, apply, I will apply to just x being this, this vector phi, and I will optimize over the y's and the z's. Okay, so yeah, here I, I just did that. So again, the, the parallel sum between rho tensor identity and identity tensor sigma sandwiched with phi is the infimum over all operator z. Now I'm in the tensor product Hilbert space. And so, uh, yeah, my first term is rho tensor identity over T, sandwiched with Z. And uh, the second term is identity tensor sigma transpose, sandwiched with phi minus Z. Okay. okay, so what I will do now to get to the, to the original expression is I will just write Z in a fixed basis. Right, so I, I, I'll choose this, this, the same fixed basis of H that I uh, took before. Um, and I write Z as Zij I tensor J. And I just express each one of these terms. So the rho tensor identity sandwich with Z. Um, so yeah, rho tensor identity, I sandwich it with Z. You see this identity that I get a delta on Jj prime. Okay, and so... Um, uh, by just uh, reshuffling the, the vector z into a matrix, I get this expression, trace of rho times z, z star, where z is now an operator, which is obtained by just uh, flipping from uh, ket j to a bra j. Okay, and you observe that uh, yeah, and z star is, of course, the, the adjoint. And so I get this expression. Okay, so or already hopefully you start seeing where uh, this is going. Uh, this is, uh, so we already have seen this expression, the trace of rho, right? This was the first term. Uh, the second term is exactly this one, the zz star. 
and we'll get uh, with the with with the other expressions we'll get exactly uh, the other terms here so that's the idea uh, okay so let's uh, let's do this quickly so yeah if i take phi itself then uh, phi with identity tensor sigma transpose this is also a trace of uh, of sigma um uh, then if I sandwich uh, I tensor sigma transpose with Z, it's, it's exactly similar to, to the one with rho. I just get trace of sigma times Z star Z. Uh, now, if uh, for the cross terms where I have one phi and one Z, right? So these will be terms that are linear in Z, okay? Not quadratic in Z. And uh, because, yeah, this phi has, has no uh, Z parameters. And so in particular, with, uh, with, th with this choice of z that we took here, this will just be trace of sigma times z. And the other one, will, the other cross term, will naturally be trace of sigma times z star. OK, and so now if I get back to, uh, to, my, uh, to the whole expression, to this expression, and putting everything together, I get exactly what I want, right? So um, and note that, okay, here I didn't put uh, T in the, in the dependence on Z, but notice that the, um, the operators for which I'm taking the, the mean depend on T, right? So there is a T appearing here, so the optimal Z can depend on T, so I have to, to pick a different uh, operator for the different uh, operator uh, for different parallel sums. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so this putting everything together, we get what is inside the integral is has this form. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Here, this is the the, the t was not needed, but um, I put okay. Maybe it's better to let me put it here. Still. Okay, and just uh, I conclude by just uh, taking the integral. Okay, and I get back this expression. Okay, good. Uh, so I hope this was clear. Yeah, I agree that the that the formula for the parallel sum is a little bit magical, uh, but so the the main idea is to is to to uh, to reduce this relative. Sorry to reduce this relative entropy by an integral representation to an expression which is related to this parallel sum and then use the, the known results about the parallel sum. So in particular, the, the parallel sum is, uh, is known to be uh, uh, operator concave, and this is one way of showing it with this very, this, uh, an explicit way of showing it that it's operator con concave is via this variation expression. Uh, okay. Good. So we have now proved the joint convexity of the relative entropy, and see, this was the proof was not very long, right? So, and I think I did all the calculations. I didn't miss. I didn't uh, skip any details. So it's relatively short, and and again, it's in a way that makes it explicit that it's uh, jointly convex. Okay, so now, um, uh, remember, our objective was not only the, the joint convexity, it was, it, was, it was the data processing inequality, okay, or sometimes called monotonicity under, com under quantum channels. Okay, so if I apply quantum channels, the relative entropy can only decrease. Okay, and as I said before, also this is a rather generic argument. If you, if you look at this argument, it doesn't in any way depend on the quantum relative entropy. This is a... This is very generic. Okay, so for example, and okay, so I should say that there are many other useful divergences, as I mentioned. Uh, so for example, one of the most known is the, there is Rényi divergences, right? Where it was a parameter, where you have a parameter alpha. And so for, for all of these, this kind of uh, relation between uh, joint convexity and data processing holds as well. Okay, good. So let's uh, go over uh, this standard argument. So, uh, okay, so for this argument, it's useful to use a, 
the Steinspring dilation of the quantum channel E. Right? So remember, I, write, I can always write a quantum channel E in terms of uh, applying first an isometry, which I call V here, and then doing the partial trace. Okay, so I wrote it here in a compact form that E can be seen as applying an isometry. So this, this quantum channel V is just applying an isometry followed by partial trace. Okay, so the isometry is easy to handle, right? Because it's, uh, it just keeps the relative quantum relative entropy exactly the same. It doesn't change it, okay? Um, so this doesn't change anything. So the only thing I have to analyze is, and, and I put the calculation here, it's just using the, the definition. And so the only thing I need to analyze is the partial trace. Okay, so I need to show that uh, the, when I apply the partial trace to some uh, joint state, the, the relative entropy can only decrease. Okay, so yeah, this is what I'm saying. So here I'm saying I, I take two states on B and E, rho and sigma, and uh, what I would like to do is to, um, uh, to transform this rho BE into um, uh, the marginals, rho B and then sigma B. Okay. Of course, in such a way that I use uh, the convexity result that I proved uh, before. Right? Okay, so the question now is, is there a, a simple way of mapping rho B E to just rho B? Okay, and more specifically, we'll do it to rho B tensor, the identity on the E system. Okay, so if I had that, right, uh, uh, then uh, the relative entropy between rho BE and sigma BE is, is just uh, this, and the relative entropy between rho B tensor uh, identity and sigma B tensor identity is just uh, because of the additivity of the relative entropy under tensor product, this is just equal to the relative entropy between rho B and sigma B. Okay, and so the question is, uh, yeah, what kind of uh, map can we use in order to, to do this transformation? And um, <clears throat> so you might be familiar with this. Uh, uh, this is sometimes called a, a quantum one-time pad, if you want, um, because you, you erase the, the E system, you make it uh, uniform. So uh, there's a simple way of doing this by taking Pauli operators, or if you're not in the, if you're not in a, in a set of qubits, there are generalized uh, Pauli operators, right? Which is uh, the x just shifts uh, my fixed basis, my computational basis by one, so k maps to k plus one, and the z adds a phase. Okay, and so my uh, I can define this quantum channel, right? Which is by applying uh, a z followed by an x, okay, to some power m. And uh, I guess many of you would have done this calculation uh, so far, would, ha would have done this calculation at some point, is that uh, it's easy to see that uh, this map, this quantum channel, what it does is that uh, on, uh, so k, k prime, you get zero. Right? So uh, on the off diagonal terms, uh, you get zero. And on the diagonal, uh, you Okay, so why is this? It's just because uh, the sum over z of um, these phases, right? If uh, k is different from k prime, the sum of these phases uh, is equal to zero, except if k is equal to k prime. Okay, so if k is equal to k prime, now you let x act, you let the Pauli x act, okay? And then uh, if you apply a random shift to a fixed operator uh, on the diagonal, you get the identity. Okay. Good. Okay, so again, what, 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 what uh, have we seen here is that if I take my operator rho BE and, uh, and I apply uh, this uh, depolarizing map D on E and do nothing on B, what I get is rho B tensor identity on E. Okay, and same thing for sigma, of course. Okay, and now, uh, now remember I want to use the joint convexity Right? And so how will I use it? Right? So this, this channel has a very simple form. Right? It's a mixture of unitary channels. Okay? So I pick L and M at random. Okay? 
and I apply a unitary, which is uh, the Pauli Z followed by the Pauli X to the power M and N. Okay, so I can use the, I can use the convexity here. Okay, so okay, so le let's see it explicitly. So now I will use this. The, the, so I will use convexity to establish the following inequality. Um, right, so here I have the relative entropy of some mixture and the same mixture here. Okay. Uh, and I bound this by the mixture of the relative entropies. Okay, and so um, this mixture is, is nothing but what I introduced before is I apply to, ro to the state rho BE, I apply the uh, randomly chosen Pauli on the E system. And as we've seen by the previous calculation, this operator as a whole, if I take the average, it's equal to nothing but rho B tensor identity. Okay, and same thing for, for here, it's sigma B tensor identity. Okay, so now let's look at the, the other side of this inequality. So I have now an average, the average is now outside of the relative entropy. And now I have uh, a relative entropy between rho B and sigma B, but to which I apply uh, this fixed Pauli uh, L and M. Okay, but now this is not really what I was interested in. I was interested in the relative entropy between rho and sigma itself. But then this is, th these, are, these two are equal because uh, x and z are unitary, right? So, and we saw before that applying a unitary to, to uh, uh, the same unitary to rho and sigma uh, gives, uh, uh, like, keeps the relative entropy the same. Okay. Okay, and that's it, and that concludes the proof. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we've seen that. So uh, this side is just the relative entropy between rho B tensor identity and sigma B tensor identity, which is nothing but the relative entropy between rho B and sigma B. And the right-hand side is the relative entropy between rho B E and sigma B E. Okay, so we've shown that if you take the partial trace, the relative entropy can only decrease. Okay, I hope this was clear. Okay, good. Uh, so I told you also that we'll see uh, uh, somehow more direct proof of... Uh, so you see, this is very generic, right? So there is there's nothing I used about D except a few properties, like uh, invariance under isometry and um, uh, joint convexity. So you see, if I replace D here by any uh, divergence which satisfies these two things, this proof goes through, right? So if I have convexity, I go to... I get to data processing. <coughs> uh, okay, so now I'll, see, I'll, I'll look at another alternate proof of the same thing, uh, except that uh, it will be specific to this expression, right? So it will, I, I will try to tell you how that just by looking at this expression and doing some very minor uh, manipulations, you get directly the data processing. Okay, so remember this was the expression. So the relative entropy looks like this. So it's the supremum of an integral of uh, things which are linear in rho and sigma. So now I apply E to rho and sigma. Okay, so uh, I apply this operator E to rho and sigma. And so uh, uh, the natural thing to do here is to apply the adjoint on the other side of the trace. Okay, so the adjoint of E, I apply to this other operator. Right, so I will apply uh, the adjoint to identity and the adjoint to zt, zt star, etc. Okay, here I, I again forgot the t here. Okay, so now we only need a, a small claim. Uh, is that, so uh, E star, like the adjoint of E uh, uh, applied to identity is identity, right? Because this is, uh, E star is unital. Okay, so the only thing which is a bit tricky to handle is this thing. So it is uh, the, the adjoint of E applied to a product of two operators, Zt, Zt star. And of course, so what I want to do, right? What do I want to do is I want to, uh, to relate this to the, to, the, to the expression for rho and sigma itself, not for uh, um, E of rho and E and sigma. 
Okay, so I, what I would like to do is to relate uh, this thing to a product of two operators. Okay, and here also this thing. These are the difficult parts. But this is a well-known property, a simple property of, of quantum channels. Um, it's sometimes channels that satisfy this are sometimes called Schwarz maps. Um, it's the following. It says that uh, if I apply some unital completely positive map to ZZ star, this is uh, lower bounded in the positive uh, semi-definite ordering by f of z star times f of z. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so to see this, it's uh, relatively simple. You just use the complete positivity for some positive operator which is constructed from z, z star, and z star, z. Okay, if you're familiar with sure complements, this is uh, exactly what is going on. Uh, okay, so now, uh, so now, yeah, now what do I do? Uh, uh, so I just use this inequality, apply to E star, okay, and I write uh, yt to be just E star applies to zt. And now you see that I get uh, uh, E star of zt, zt star is uh, lower bounded by um, uh, E star applies to z star times E star applies to Z, okay? And so because I have a minus sign, then this becomes a, an upper bound. And so, uh, yeah, by just uh, yeah, using this inequality and plugging it in, I get uh, this expression, right? So here I get uh, yt, yt star, and, and I do exactly the same on the other side. So the identity is, is just by unitality here, it's, uh, it's just linear, so I, I don't have to use this, this Schwarz inequality. Um, oops. Uh, <coughs> and, but here I use it again, but just inverting z and z star. Okay, but this is nothing but the original expression for the relative entropy, okay, where I just called yt equal to zt. Okay, so uh, again, yeah, I, I wanted to show this to show you how uh, useful it is, let's say, to um, to have such expressions which are linear in, in rho and sigma. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to, uh, to discuss today is um, uh, an implication of these, uh, uh, of this uh, data processing inequality to just entropies, okay? So forget relative entropies. So uh, many of you, uh, uh, might be dealing with just uh, von Neumann entropies, but not really relative entropies. So let's see what, what are the consequences. And um, uh, yeah, so this is sometimes called strong subadditivity, okay, of the von Neumann entropy. Uh, so what is the, the way of writing it, which, which, uh, which justifies this name of strong subadditivity? Um, so subadditivity would be the version without conditioning on C, right? So if I don't condition on C, it's just saying that h of a plus h of b is at most h of a, b. And the strong version is when you condition on c. Uh, okay, so it's sometimes you can write it in this way. This makes it obvious why it's called strong subadditivity. There is a, just by basic rewriting, uh, this is equivalent to uh, saying that if I condition on an additional system, right? So imagine I look at the entropy of a condition on c, and now I condition, uh, I condition on an additional system that I call B here, then the, the von Neumann entropy can only decrease, okay, which is natural. Right? Um, and this is, again, equivalent to some uh, other quantity, which is the conditional mutual information uh, being non-negative. Okay, so these are all rewritings of the same thing. Okay, I'm not sure I define the conditional mutual information in the general setting. It's just equal to the difference between these two quantities. It's just by definition, the difference of these two. So. Okay, so, um, okay, so just briefly, why, why is it the case that, uh, that the data processing inequality implies uh, these three uh, inequalities? Uh, it's, it's immediate, but uh, let's let's do let's go through it. So, um, uh, yeah, if I compute the von Neumann entropy of A condition on B C, 
right? This is, remember the definition, it's minus the relative entropy between the joint state on ABC and identity on A tensor rho BC. Okay, and what is the version where I condition? Ah, I only. Uh, okay, it's it's a symmetric, but it doesn't correspond to here. Maybe let me see. Uh, A and B play exactly the same role. Consistent with what I wrote here. Let me just uh, correct this. And this is fine. Um, I think all is good. Okay, so ah, yeah, thanks. Um, Okay, so yeah, now it's now written in this way. It's obvious how to go from here to here. I just need to partial trace B. Okay, so if I partial trace B, uh, I get from here to here, and uh, this quantity is smaller than this quantity, and so the with a minus sign, it's the opposite. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so how to see that uh, two implies one? Okay, this is uh, again very simple uh, von Neumann entropy manipulation, uh, and I think you've seen a bit of that in the in the exercise session yesterday. So um, yes, I can write. Uh, remember, by definition, if you want, uh, or or by the simple properties of the log, uh, h of a condition on B C is equal to the joint von Neumann entropy minus the entropy on B C, and uh, I can add and subtract h of C. And so this gives me H of A, B conditioned on C minus H of B conditioned on C. Okay, and so uh, uh, by combining, uh, uh, yeah, th so this is exactly the same as, is, is exactly equivalent to this inequality. I should say that this equality is uh, often quite useful. It's uh, called the chain rule for the, uh, for the von Neumann entropy. And uh, yeah, so it allows you to decompose the entropy. Why is it useful? And even though it's a, it's a sort of an obvious identity, is because it allows you to decompose the, the entropy of a joint system, AB, as a sum of the entropies of the parts, right? So the entropy of B, condition on C, plus the entropy of A, provided you condition on both B and C. Okay, but this is often a useful tool. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, concerning the third one, as I said before, the conditional mutual information is anyway defined as the difference of these entropies, so um, uh, it's, it's uh, in this case obvious that uh, these are all equivalent. Okay, good. So uh, that ends what I wanted to say for today. So uh, let me just briefly recap is that uh, I hope you, you have seen that uh, the Data processing inequality, it's uh, not too hard to prove it, uh, and it re it's related to its joint convexity, and that it is a sort of um, uh, a general um, uh, inequality that can be used to get uh, the useful inequalities we know about for the von Neumann entropy. And so I'll stop here for today. Thank you. <laughs>